I failed in my business venture and now I'm in debt of 1.8 million. I tried borrowing money from friends and family. It wasn't much. Just 1,000 yuan for living expenses. But nobody would lend it to me. Now I've become the butt of their jokes. I used to be so successful, and now I can't even scrape together 1,000 yuan. I finally hit rock bottom. I'm bankrupt. My factory, my future, and the jobs of over a hundred employees are all gone. I used to be a factory owner and contractor worth millions, running a paint factory with annual sales in the tens of millions, and owning two construction companies with projects all over the country. I was the pride and hope of my family. Starting in 2020, due to the overall economic situation, I couldn't collect debts and the company began to struggle. Foolishly, I took on another project, thinking it would be my saving grace. It turned out to be a disaster, fully funded by myself, and I ended up in massive debt due to a chain of bad debts. Desperately, I put in all my savings and even borrowed money to keep afloat, hoping to recover. But it was no use. I lost my house, car, and shop overnight. A total loss of 30 million in assets. It's 2 a.m. now, and I'm still outside. I've lost my home, and I don't know where to go. It's been two months since my company went bankrupt, and today I cleared out all my assets. I'm left with nothing but a mountain of debt. I don't want to see anyone now, afraid that my friends and family will see how destitute I've become. This woman once owned 49 companies and had a net worth of over 100 million. However, she has not only lost all her assets, but is now in debt of over 7 million yuan. In recent years, the Chinese economy has continued to decline, impacted by the pandemic and the sluggish economic recovery that followed. A large number of factories and companies have struggled to survive, leading to a nationwide wave of closures. Entrepreneurs and small business owners, once prosperous and wealthy, are now either struggling for their business's survival or facing bankruptcy and crippling debt. Some jokingly say that in early 2023, they planned to make it big but ended up making themselves into ruins instead. With businesses going bankrupt and owners drowning in debt, the banking sector is also facing financial challenges. In May 2023, a collective wage claim incident occurred at Shanghai Pudong Development Bank. And then at the end of the year, China Merchants Bank, one of China's leading commercial banks, initiated a reverse wage claim from its employees. Is it possible that even such a prominent bank needs to ask employees for money to get by? On the evening of December 28, 2023, the bank issued a supervisory board resolution announcement. The announcement approved the recovery and clawback of 2022 performance compensation, meaning the bank is reclaiming previously paid employee performance bonuses. In fact, a little research reveals that China Merchants Bank's reverse wage claim practice had already occurred. However, as 2023 drew to a close, this symbolic move, after being reported in the media, gained attention once more. Can wages that have already been paid out be taken back? Yes, they can, and if you don't return them, you might even face a lawsuit. Recently, several banks have started reclaiming wages from their employees. China Merchants Bank and Bohai Bank had over 3,000 employees from whom they took back a total of 75 million yuan in bonuses. What's going on here? It turns out that the salary recovery and clawback system for financial institutions is now being implemented, and as soon as 
business system is in place, banks started using it extensively. In 2021, China Merchants Bank asked 2,876 of its employees to return a total of 58.2 million yuan in wages, averaging about 20,300 yuan per person. At Bohai Bank, 370 employees were asked to return a total of 17.6 million yuan, which works out to about 47,600 yuan each. Although other banks haven't disclosed specific figures, it appears that over 95% of banks have already set up the system. Sounds pretty devastating, right? Bank employees might not only miss out on their year-end bonuses, but they might also have to return them if they've already been paid. So does this mean that honest, hardworking people don't deserve their wages? Well, year-end bonuses are likely to be clawed back only under certain conditions. First, if there's been falsification in performance assessments. Second, if there's been a violation in increasing sales or if sales remuneration was distributed without authorization. Third, if the compensation was based on other incorrect information. So it's not like they're just taking back this money for no reason. In addition to reverse wage claims, there are reports that banks in China are cutting back on travel expenses. Employees are being asked not to use business class and to opt for cheaper train seats and lower-priced hotel rooms instead. Reports suggest that other brokers and banks, facing profit pressures and signals from the CCP authorities to reduce expenditures, are also striving to cut costs. Moreover, the Ministry of Finance has urged state-owned banks to control budgets and reduce wages and costs. As of September 2023, the net interest margins of banks dropped to a historical low of 1.7%, below the 1.8% threshold analysts and industry practitioners consider necessary for maintaining reasonable profitability. Simultaneously, non-performing loans have hit a new high. There is speculation that the continuous income growth of some Chinese state-owned banks since 2017 may come to a halt. The constant pressure from CCP authorities on banking giants to support struggling real estate companies and local government financing platforms has exacerbated the difficulties in China's financial sector. Regarding the bank's pursuit of reclaiming wages from employees, Professor Shi Tian of the University of South Carolina Aiken Business School said, Now, CCP state-owned enterprises, institutions, and various organizations are in dire need of money with expenses outweighing income and the economy in distress. In this situation, the employees, fearing the loss of their iron rice bowl, might have no choice but to cough up the demanded money. He further points out that banks, state-owned enterprises and institutions are all busy looking for where they can get money to fill their financial gaps. This indicates that the Chinese economy has entered a severe recession. For instance, on September 18, 2023, Yangzhou City in Jiangsu Province requested civil servants in various counties and districts to return the basic performance bonuses for 2021 that had already been paid, with the process to be completed by the end of March 2024. It is incredible that Yangzhou, a relatively prosperous city, is also struggling financially to the extent of asking civil servants for money. Chinese civil servants do not have high basic salaries. Their primary income comes from various significant policy-driven incentives. If civil servants lose these extra incomes, the so-called party cohesion bought by the CCP through benefits will rapidly collapse. Netizens believe that the widespread suspension and retraction of bonuses are due to fiscal tensions, indicating the CCP's impending downfall. Regarding the reverse wage claim incident at China Merchants Bank, a blogger in Shanghai who has been in the banking mortgage loan industry for nearly a decade commented in a video on December 29, 2023. I've been working in the mortgage loan sector of banking in Shanghai for nearly a decade, and I've got to say, I've never really heard of this kind of situation before. But from what I can see, the reason we're seeing this now is mainly because of the huge drop in housing prices. In the past, these types of bank deals didn't lead to bad debts. Now, with the decline in property values, we're seeing more cases where customers can't repay their loans after they default and their loans get called on, before people could use their homes as collateral.
collateral to switch to another bank and keep things going, but that's not working anymore. What's worse, with the significant fall in property prices and the economic downturn, money's hard to come by, and businesses' main revenues are just dismal. So, wouldn't it naturally lead to a massive increase in the proportion of bad loans for the banks? Some people say, well, if the performance pay was given, just accept it. It's ruthless for a bank to claw back money from its employees. But the way I see it, the reality of capital is just too harsh. The bank is basically trying to reclaim what it can from its own staff, whether you quit or complain. The bank keeps up its shiny exterior, and even if you leave, there will always be a new wave of people eager to step in. Data shows that on March 24, 2023, an article published by the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission revealed that over 95% of institutions in China's banking and insurance sectors have formulated and implemented similar systems. The article claimed that, like deferred salary payments, the performance compensation recovery and clawback system is also a significant part of the financial industry's salary adjustment. According to public information, in August 2022, the Chinese Ministry of Finance issued a notice. It explicitly proposed that for senior executives in financial enterprises and employees in positions with direct or significant impact on risk, the basic salary should not exceed 35% of the total remuneration. Based on business income and risk assessment over stages, over 40% of the performance compensation should be paid in a deferred manner, with a term of not less than three years. Moreover, the provisions for the recovery and clawback of performance compensation apply equally to retired or resigned personnel. Industry insiders believe that the Chinese Ministry of Finance's release of salary regulation, documents for financial enterprises, and the ongoing practice of banks reclaiming wages from employees are mainly due to two reasons. Firstly, the frequent crises in the real estate industry in recent years have continually spread to the financial sector. Property developers' inability to repay huge debts has led to a substantial increase in bad debts for many banks. Secondly, China is currently in a period of economic recession, with frequent waves of closures and unemployment across various industries, making it difficult for businesses to make money. Consequently, there have been many instances of loan defaults. In fact, reports from last year indicated that since 2022, several top Chinese banks have fallen into a credit crisis. In the first six months of 2023, the four major state-owned banks had a total of 1.2 trillion yuan, about 165 billion US dollars, in non-performing loans, an increase of 7.6% from the end of 2022. The China Banking Association reported that the construction sector, primarily the real estate industry, saw an almost 32% increase in bad loans. China Merchants Bank reported a 28% rise in bad real estate loans. In a report dated August 9, 2023, J.P. Morgan analyst Catherine Lay stated that as of the end of 2021, the bank had lent 39.9 billion yuan to developers, making it more susceptible to negative news. This explains why China Merchants Bank's reverse wage claim was the largest in amount and involved the most number of employees. This matter has drawn significant public attention. However, such reverse wage claims by banks could have serious repercussions. It may lead to greater caution or outright rejection by bank executives when issuing loans to real estate companies in the future. The consequence would be even more difficult for debt-ridden real estate companies in securing bank loans, leading to more property developers facing crises or going bankrupt. Suspended construction projects or unfinished buildings might also remain incomplete due to developers' lack of funds. This approach is also contrary to the CCP government's policies aimed at boosting the real estate market. In an effort to rescue the faltering real estate industry since 2022, the CCP has introduced a series of supportive policies. In the credit domain, in November 2022, the People's Bank of China and the CBIRC launched the 16 financial measures to support bond financing for private real estate enterprises. The 16 financial measures also allowed debt extension for property developers and increased financing support asking commercial banks to actively implement the measures and follow up. The purpose, they claimed, was to resolve major economic and financial risks and prevent crossing over the bottom line into systemic collapse. According to the China Securities Regulatory Commission's estimates at the time, the measures were expected to support 250 billion yuan, around $35 billion, in bond financing for private enterprises, 
According to mainland media reports, as of the end of November that year, 11 banks, including the six major ones, had signed agreements with 28 real estate companies involving intended credit amounts exceeding 229.5 billion yuan. According to CBRC statistics, in the first 10 months of 2022, the banking sector issued 2.6 trillion yuan in real estate development loans and 4.8 trillion yuan in mortgage loans. Additionally, on July 10, 2023, the PBOC and CBIRC further extended some policies of the aforementioned 16 financial measures until December 31, 2024. The policy extension involved two aspects. First, for existing financing such as real estate development loans and trust loans expiring before December 31, 2024, an extension of more than one year beyond the original date is permitted. Second, for commercial banks, it is required that for syndicated financing issued to special borrowing support projects before December 31, 2024, the risk classification is not lowered within the loan term. For non-performing loans arising from newly issued syndicated financing, the relevant institutions and personnel, if they have performed their duties, may be exempted from responsibility. In summary, the PBOC and the National Financial Regulatory Administration had to continue to support the real estate market with financial measures even as non-performing loans increase. So now, the question arises. Are these bank executives, who are being asked to return performance pay, related to the non-performing loans caused by these supporting policies? The contradictory demands of the CCP inevitably leave those executing the policies in a dilemma, trapped between two conflicting choices. Many current affairs commentators believe that the CCP's policies are consistently contradictory, always wanting to have their cake and eat it too. What does this mean? For instance, in terms of epidemic prevention, the CCP demands strict implementation of zero COVID policies, while also wanting to develop the economy, two inherently conflicting goals that cannot be achieved simultaneously. Of course, there are many more such contradictory demands, such as wanting both common prosperity and a market economy, seeking peaceful unification with Taiwan while also mobilizing for war, desiring foreign investment while harboring xenophobia, and superficially mediating the Russia-Ukraine war while secretly supplying weapons to Russia, among others. However, this pattern of wanting everything ultimately leads to achieving nothing. The current collective inaction and complacency among CCP officials exemplify this paradoxical approach. In the past decade, the CCP's aggressive anti-corruption campaign has essentially drained the motivation of officials at all levels. Three years of pandemic prevention have brought immense hardships to these officials. Local fiscal deficits caused by nucleic acid testing and free vaccines have led to central government indifference, leaving local governments to fend for themselves. The officials, seething with anger yet unable to speak out, have resorted to inaction, incompetence, and resignations, resulting in a severe governance crisis for the CCP. Thus, the consequences of the bank's reverse salary demands from employees are not hard to imagine. China's economy faces comprehensive problems, reflected in the imbalance of its economic structure, particularly the overemphasis on the real estate sector for many years. Now, with the downturn in real estate, the entire economy is affected, leading to crises in finance, local finance, and other areas. For local governments that have relied on land sales for operational funds, the slump in the real estate market means a sharp decline in fiscal revenues. According to data from the CCP's Ministry of Finance, in the first 10 months of 2023, national government fund budget revenues saw a significant drop, with land sale revenues declining by over 20% year-on-year. While government fiscal revenues decrease, the burden of local debts related to real estate becomes unsustainable. To repay impending debts, local governments have increased the issuance of new bonds. This influx of new local debt has drained liquidity from the financial system leaving banks with insufficient funds to support enterprise development, ultimately leading to a loss of economic vitality. Recently, China's financial circles have been discussing the problem of the growing disparity between M1 and M2 growth rates. M1, which includes demand deposits and cash, also known as liquid money, reflects the proportion of funds in society that can be mobilized at any time. M2, or quasi-money, is a standard used by the central bank to assess the money supply, comprising M1 plus time deposits, personal savings, and other deposits. Savings and fixed deposits are generally considered less liquid and not directly involved in economic activities, merely representing social wealth. 
Famous financial blogger Lao Man recently tweeted that a prominent monetary phenomenon in China is the continuous decline in the proportion of M1 to total money. The growth rate of M1 has been significantly weaker than that of M2, causing a continual decrease in the M1 to M2 ratio, from 39.5% in 2000 to 23.5% in November this year. M1 represents liquid money that individuals can use for immediate consumption and that enterprises use for short-term operations and investments. Therefore, a larger proportion of liquid money indicates a more vibrant economy. Lao Man analyzed that according to historical trends, the ratio of M1 to M2 has been plummeting since 2017. Regardless of how much liquidity the central bank injects, the funds do not become liquid money, but rather end up in bank wealth management products or local bonds, circulating between the government debt platform and the banking system without contributing to investment or consumption. Additionally, considering the trillions of cash smuggled from Shenzhen to Hong Kong annually, the market's liquid money quantity is further reduced, exacerbating the trend. This is perhaps the most accurate reflection of China's current economic status, a loss of vitality. Other financial analysts suggest that another key reason for the disparity in the growth rates of M1 and M2 might be the rapid decline in real estate sales, leading to a rapid decrease in M1. Historically, M1 has been significantly correlated with real estate sales. It's easy to understand. Residents' use of savings to purchase real estate increases the cash on developers' accounts. With the sharp reduction in real estate sales, developers struggle to make money, naturally reducing M1. This is also why the real estate sector was previously referred to as a capital reservoir in the industry. In summary, the ongoing crisis in China's real estate market, coupled with a persistent economic downturn, has not only triggered a financial system crisis, but also led to a decrease in government fiscal revenue. The government, therefore, has had to rely on issuing bonds to sustain itself. However, this bond issuance has drained market liquidity, further sapping the economy's vitality. People's incomes naturally decline, diminishing their desire to purchase homes and further exacerbating the real estate market slump. This creates a vicious cycle, leading to a continuous deterioration of the Chinese economy trapping it in a quagmire from which it cannot extricate itself. Consequently, many analysts believe that regardless of the supportive policies the CCP introduces, or how hard they try to salvage the housing market, as long as the self-contradictory, wanting-it-both-ways approach persists, these efforts will ultimately be futile.